Um, hope you're well. Um, if you've got a Bible, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. We're going to be continuing through Mark's gospel. Today we're going to be looking at verse 17 through to verse 19. There was once a man, and this man, he asked a theologian, he said, Jesus, he said to the theologian, why do you think that Jesus chose Judas? I mean, he's Jesus. He must have known what Jesus, Judas was going to do. And the theologian replied to the man, actually, I don't think that's the most important question you can ask. I think the most important question you can ask is not why did Jesus choose Judas, but why did Jesus choose me? Why did Jesus choose me? And I think that's a great question for us to be asking. Not that we can look down on ourselves, but that we can look up in awe at the grace, the love, and the favor of Jesus. And so my prayer for us this morning as we journey through this text is that any doubts you have or any frustrations you have about your identity in Christ, your calling, your, your, your being appointed into Christ, that that would be replaced with just confidence. Confidence in who God has called you to be and in confidence in who God has appointed you to be as a follower of Jesus. And so to recap on last week, uh, Mark preached uh, from a little earlier on, well, back end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3. And Jesus had a couple of run-ins with religious leaders concerning uh, what he was doing on the Sabbath uh, in the first instance, he was criticized because his disciples were picking heads of, of grain and, and eating it. And he was criticized for that. And in the second instance, he was criticized because he healed a man on the Sabbath. And then it reads that the, the religious leaders, they kind of went and spoke to the Herodians about how they might plot against Jesus and to destroy him. And what we see in the Gospels is obviously until it was Jesus' appointed time, he would withdraw. And that's what he's done here. He's, he's withdrawn. And so we pick it up in verse 7. And in my Bible, this is titled, A Great Crowd Follow Jesus. Verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. And a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the, crowd, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. I don't know about you, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with social media. I like social media. I can, see, I can see the dangers of social media, but at the same time I like it because if you want to get word out quickly to anywhere in the world, you can. So if I popped my phone out now, took a little selfie, hashtag RBC, hashtag preaching, hashtag Mark's Gospel, post, within a few minutes, anyone in any corner of the world has access to that post. But back in Jesus' day, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have social media. They didn't have hashtags. So for word to be getting around as fast and as, as it was and as far as it was said something about the profound impact that Jesus was having in Israel. People wanted to, people wanted to see. They'd heard of this man who was, 
who was driving out demons, who was healing all kinds of diseases, who turned water into wine, this man who preached with such power and authority. And they wanted to see him, and they were willing to travel miles to see him, to experience something of him. And it says that that some people traveled from Idumea, which is southern Israel, it's modern day Negev, to where Jesus was. That would have been a journey of about 140 miles. That's a long old trip by foot. Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee would have been about 70 miles. People traveling from Tyre and Sidon, that would have been a trip of about 70 miles. It's a long way. So they obviously really wanted to see Jesus, but why? Why? And we we see this kind of repeated patterning happen throughout not just this gospel, but the gospels of why the crowd was following Jesus. And we read that in verse 8. It's because they heard of what Jesus was doing. They heard about the works that he was doing. And you know, sometimes I think we can be a little bit overcritical of people in the Bible. So um, if I say to you, Thomas, what do you think of? Now, I bet there are going to be some of you who thought, oh yeah, he's the one that doubted. Now, Thomas went on to do some amazing things for the Lord. He laid down his life for the sake of the gospel. But yet, the one thing we remember about him, oh yeah, he's the guy that doubted. And and Peter, again, we know that, that Peter, we read a bit more about Peter in the scripture than we do about Thomas, but we know, again, he went on again to lay his life down for the sake of the gospel. He did some amazing things for the Lord, but I'm guessing when we say Peter, the first thing that some of us will think about, oh yeah, he's the guy that denied Jesus. But I guess what we have to remember is that today we have something that they didn't have. They were living in the moment, but today we've got the full God-breathed canon of Scripture. We've got 2,000 years of biblical insight. We've got commentaries. We've got teachings at our fingertips, as well as our own personal experience of walking with Jesus under the banner of the finished work of the cross. And so we can look back through our enlightened lenses at the people who were living in the moment, and we can be like, idiots. I mean, they walked with Jesus, they talked with Jesus, they were there with him, but they didn't get it. And you're right, they, they kind of didn't get it. They missed the point of who Jesus was. They were still trying to figure out who this amazing man was. And so it would be easy to be critical of the crowd. Oh, they're just pursuing Jesus just because of what he can do. They just want to see his signs and wonders, especially because now we know that Jesus came to do so much more than just a physical work in us. But he came to set us free from the greatest disease that plagues all of humanity, and that is the disease of sin. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But you cannot deny that a big part of Jesus' ministry, it was signs and wonders. Jesus did signs and wonders. And so I just want to explore this a little bit more, because something that I think the church is good at is when we see something happening in excess, what we do is we go, oh, that's really bad, and we run a complete million miles in the opposite direction. We lose balance the other way. And signs and wonders, I think, is a place where this has happened. We see people that, where they, these kind of so-called revivals, and it all gets a bit wacky, all a bit weird. They're all calling it signs and wonders, when in reality, it's just a big, messy work of the flesh. Maybe it started off as a work of God, but then man takes over. And so we see that and we're like, ooh, ooh, no. And then we can possibly start to see signs and wonders as a bad thing. We can see signs and wonders as a kind of as a threat to the gospel, as an enemy to the gospel, as a distraction from the gospel, when in reality, signs and wonders should accompany the preaching of the gospel. Because they're not a threat to the gospel, but they're a witness to the gospel and to the power of Jesus. And so in Acts chapter 4, consider the apostles' prayer when they pray for boldness. What do they pray? They say this, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. So they're prioritizing. Let us continue to preach your word with boldness, but still, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And so if we're going to apply this, I guess a question that we have to ask ourselves is, are signs and wonders still for today? Well, for me, there is nothing in Scripture that suggests that they're not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We still live in a broken, messed up world. Jesus is still full of love, full of compassion. 
And so absolutely, yes, I would say signs and wonders are still for today. And so the next question I would ask then is, okay, what is the purpose of signs and wonders? Well, I've already said in, in previous messages that everything that Jesus did says something about who he was. And so a miracle, it's not actually about the miracle, but it's designed to point us to something greater than the miracle. It's supposed to point us to the wonder, to signpost us to the wonder of who God is. So then as I was thinking about this, I found myself becoming quite challenged. Because then I thought, well, okay, who is it then that actually needs signposting to Jesus? Is it the church? Is it those people who are saved? Do they primarily need signposting to Jesus? No, but actually it's those who are lost. They're the ones who need signposting to Jesus. Those people outside the church, those people who are still lost in their sin, they are the people who need signposting to Jesus. And again, I found this incredibly challenging because when I think about who I've prayed for over the years, probably 98% of people have been people in the church. And That's not a bad thing. It's good to pray for our brothers and sisters. Absolutely, yes, to encourage and to lift up one another in prayer. But when I look at at Jesus' ministry, the majority of his ministry took place where? Outside. And when we read the book of Acts, there are several occasions where miracles helped lead to conversions. A couple of examples. In Acts chapter 9, Peter heals Aeneas. And Luke says, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. And later in that same chapter, Peter raises Tabitha from the dead, and then Luke says, it became known to all Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And so the question I'm left with is, how willing am I to not only be bold in proclaiming the good news of Jesus to those who do not know him, but also, how willing am I to step out in faith And ask the Lord for opportunities to pray for a miracle in the midst of these people's circumstances and situations. Now hear me. I'm not saying signs and wonders save because they don't. Salvation is only by grace alone through faith and repentance. But what I am saying is that signs and wonders can play a part in bringing people to Christ. And that's why it's not wrong to desire, to ask for, and to expect signs and wonders as long as we recognize their place in accompanying accompanying the proclaimed gospel of Jesus Christ. And that we recognize their place in pointing people to something greater and serving as a witness to the grace and power of Jesus. Yes, it's a wonderful thing for people to be attracted to Jesus. But if their focus is only on what Jesus can do for them instead of the truth of who he is, they're not going to follow him for long. We see this in John's gospel. Great crowds are following him. Then Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And then people like, and they're gone. And so Jesus says to his disciples, what about you? Are you going to go? And what they say is actually quite profound, because this is where you see the difference. This is where you see the contrast. They say, well, no, Lord, where else would we go? Besides, you have the words of eternal life. So you've got those who are following Jesus for his works. Then when Jesus actually laid it down and says, no, actually, this is what it really means to follow me, they were gone. But then when when the disciples are asked, the response is, actually, no, your truth you're the word of truth. We want to we wanna stay with you. And that's why signs and wonders will always have to accompany the gospel and never replace the gospel. The gospel, it's a message of repentance. It's a message of denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus. It's not a message of obey a bunch of rules and just click your fingers when you need Jesus to come and do something for you. But perhaps we can draw something positive from the crowd. Yes, their focus was wrong, but I kind of admire the crowd for traveling crazy distances to meet Jesus because they'd heard that just one touch or one word from Jesus could change everything. When I say that, I always think of that song, that Godfrey Bersel song, you know, just one touch from the king changes everything. YouTube it, it's a good song. But what is even more amazing is that Jesus is just so full of love 
and grace and compassion. He would have known their hearts. He would have known their motives. He would have known their reasons for pursuing him. But when we read this account in Matthew's gospel, it says what? It says that Jesus healed them all. So please never think that God is not interested in your physical problems because he is. It's just there is something more important than the state of your body, and that is the state of your soul. And that is why Jesus came, and this is what the crowds were missing. They were more interested in the state of their bodies than in the condition of their souls. They flocked to Jesus, not because of the truth that he was preaching that could change the soul, but rather of what he could do that could change the body. Again, I'm not saying your bodies aren't important because they are. God made your body. Your body is fearfully and wonderfully made. It was knitted together in your mother's room. Your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. And as you would look after the home in which you dwell in, so look after your body that the Holy Spirit dwells in. Take care of your bodies, but without being too doom and gloom, your bodies are running out. Every day that you live is one day closer to the day when your body will just stop working. So would you rather not invest in something that never runs out, something that lives forever? In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asks, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? To gain the whole world is to, is to gain, to receive what the world has to offer, the health, the wealth, the comfort, the power, the prosperity. And to lose your soul is to die without a right relationship with Christ and spend eternity in a place that the Bible calls hell. Now, if you're listening to this this morning and you are not a Christian, please notice what I just said. It is about a right relationship with Jesus. It's not about keeping a, a bunch of rules. It's not about just behaving yourself. It's not about doing good works. It's not even about attending church or, or saying your prayers. It's about being in right relationship with God because the barrier of sin that separates us from God was removed because Jesus suffered the punishment for the sin that you deserved, that I deserved when he died on the cross. And so my question to you this morning is this, do you have a right relationship with God? If you don't, then you are currently rejecting Christ and you are rejecting his offer of salvation. And yes, rejecting Christ might mean temporary earthly gains, but it comes at the worst possible price because you lose that which is of eternal value. You lose your soul. Jesus came that you might have life in all of its fullness. And that was the truth that he preached and it was the price that he was willing to pay for each one of us when he died on the cross. And so if you are not a Christian, please don't throw away what is eternal just to gain the temporary, but choose Jesus today because in choosing Jesus, you choose life. And we're told in scripture, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you're not a Christian here this morning, speak to somebody, please speak to somebody before you leave. Verse 13, and he went up on the mountain and he called to him those whom he desired and they came to him and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. There is always something that precedes a person following Jesus and that is for them to be called. And so in Jesus' day, how it would usually work, if a person wanted to study under a rabbi, they would kind of apply, very much uh, like today you would apply to study at a college or a university. Back in those days, you would apply to study under a rabbi. And uh, the rabbi would kind of check you out, and if he thought you were good enough and you're academic enough, then he may or he, he may not accept you. But there is a big difference to what we see Jesus doing. Firstly, Jesus didn't look for the qualified. He didn't look for the elite. And secondly, to study under a rabbi would be to study the scriptures, to study the law. But notice what Jesus called them to. He called them to himself. He called them to himself. So if you're a Christian here this morning, you are called. You are called. The Greek word for called is kaleo. Another form of the word, a word you'll be familiar with probably, is the word ecclesia, which is where we get the word church from. And it literally means the called out ones or a gathering of people that have been called out of one place into another. 
And so spiritually speaking, to be called is to be called out of the unbelieving world. Yes, into Christ as an individual, but also into the body of believers. And I think this is really important, especially today, because the last 15 months of social restrictions has meant that we've, we've been limited in, in the fellowship, in the community that we can enjoy. But something that I think even before COVID, a, a, a battle we've been fighting is the issue of individualism, which is defined as the habit of being independent and self-reliant. Independence and self-reliance, that is not how God created you to function. You will not thrive and you will not flourish as a Christian if you choose independence and self-reliance because we're created to thrive and flourish through connections and in community with other believers. And yeah, over the last, over a year, through social restrictions, we've been forced to become less connected. Yes, we have technology, that's helped us kind of stay a bit connected. And I'm grateful for that technology, but it is not the same. It's not the same. People might say, well, it's all right, as long as I'm connected to Jesus, then like I said, that's great because you are called and saved out of the world and into Christ as an individual, but you are also called and saved out of the world into this wonderful community called the church. And this tells us something as to the importance of fellowship and being around other people believers. And I, I suppose this, this next bit, I'm kind of not really talking to you because you're here. Just keep listening, but I'm kind of aiming this towards people who are, who are listening online. Please listen when I say I'm not judging, I'm not pointing the finger, but for many of us, engaging with church online has become our new normal. But as COVID restrictions are easing, it would be easy just to stay at home and keep engaging that way. For us as a family, we've had to be intentional. Because isn't it it's easy? I'll just roll out of bed, grab my coffee, put my slippers on, chuck church on. But there is a difference between watching online and having in-person fellowship. And so all I would ask, and I ask this for your good and for your joy, is that you are really before the Lord about whether you should be back in church or not. In fellowship with other believers. Now the outcome of that is between you and God. But please ensure that you are getting face-to-face -face fellowship with other Christians during the week. You are a disciple of Jesus, saved out of the world and into the body of believers. And this community called the church, that is the context for discipleship to take place. And so if you want to thrive as a Christian, if you want to flourish as a Christian, it's got to take place in the context of Christian community. So you are called. Secondly, you are appointed. Now this word appointed, we would usually use to describe a person being a, a, given a, a particular task or being appointed into a position. Uh, someone was appointed as a CEO, for example. But the word appointed perhaps isn't the best English word for us to use to describe what is kind of what's meant here. Because this word appoint in the original language actually means to make or to create. And so where else we see this word used? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Another place we see this word is when Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So when it says that Jesus appointed the 12, it's not just saying that Jesus gave them a job to do. Yes, that's part of it, but it's deeper than that. It's saying that he made them into something to be something that they were not before. But verse 14 tells us why. That they might be with him. And this being with Jesus is both a positional statement and it's a practical statement. It's positional in that when you first surrendered your life to Jesus, then you were positioned out of the world and positioned into Christ. You are positioned with Christ. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And it's practical because the first and most important privilege and responsibility for every one of us that's a Christian this morning is that you would be with Jesus, communing with him daily, spending time in his word, spending time in prayer. But then notice what it is that followed them being with Jesus, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. The outworking of you being with Jesus is that you might reflect him in both word 
and action. And we see this pattern in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. So that is you're being positioned into Christ. You're a new creation. But then it then goes on to say that as a new creation, we have been given a ministry of reconciliation, that we have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation, and that we are ambassadors for Christ. And so the Christian life, it's one of coming, it's one of going, coming to Jesus and then going out to make disciples. But this coming and going, they don't happen apart from each other. They happen in conjunction with one another. And the effectiveness of your going out is dependent on the effectiveness of your coming in and being with Jesus. So funny story, um, so please laugh. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, um, a girl started coming to this church. Uh, she, she wasn't around for long, but she started coming to a girl I went to school with. And at the time, I was leading the youth work here. And uh, a point I would always make to the young people was um, I was just really encouraging them to be missional in their school. And I would say to them, Look, if you're going to proclaim Christ, if you're going to talk about this Jesus that changes lives, you've got to make sure that your life shows them that you have been changed. And so this, I was there chatting to this guy, I haven't seen you for ages, yeah, I remember you from school. And all the young people were kind of gathered around. And then she looks at me and she said, huh, that's funny, I never knew you were a Christian. And the young people were like, what? <laughs> Because, and I was a Christian in school. I even started the Christian Union in school. And, um, but, but anyway, and, but the young people found that highly amusing. You kind of think, oh, ouch, because you want people to recognize that you have been with Jesus by the way that you live. In Acts chapter 4, we read of Peter and John before the Jewish council. And it tells us that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and common men, they were astonished, love this bit, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And I don't think that's just a practical, oh yeah, they're the guys that hang out with Jesus. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. And what I love about the calling of the disciples and what we see here in Acts chapter 4, it tells us this. It tells us that God calls and God appoints ordinary people Ordinary people in everyday walks of life to be with him and to be about his kingdom work. And this is so important because there will be people listening to this who still struggle to believe that they could be both loved by God and used by God. But listen, God's love for you is not dependent on you. God loves you because God is love. Because he is full of love, he's full of grace, he's full of compassion. And he uses you, not because he needs you, he's not using you because he's depending on you to do something for him, but because he wants to work through you to equip you and empower you by his Holy Spirit. And so I think what we have to do, we have to get away, and it's just, it, you might call it semantics, but I think we have to get away from this, this thinking of calling and appointing being all about vocation, because it's not. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ here this morning, then you have been called and you have been appointed. You have been called and appointed, firstly, to be with Jesus. And in whatever sphere of society God has called you, to be bold in presenting the gospel to those around you in word and in action. Your calling and your appointing is valid until the day Jesus calls you home. And I know that there are folk here who will need to hear this. Maybe because of the season of life that you're in, you cannot do the things that you used to do. Listen, your calling and your appointing still stands God's economy is different to ours. You're of no less use to God today or less valuable to God today than you were 25 years ago. So please, stop comparing your today with your yesterday. Stop comparing, stop worrying about what tomorrow may or may not bring. Instead, just praise God for today. Make yourself available for him today. Trust in his direction and strength for you today. And then when tomorrow comes, do it again. The reason any of us are still here is because God has not finished with us yet. And sometimes we can get so bogged down by kind of what we've done, by our ministry, by our influence, by our, our gifting. But that is always 
going to be secondary to the greatest calling a person can receive. And that is to be with Jesus. Because everything else flows from that. And so to finish, and to come back to that first question, why did Jesus choose me? Verse 13. He went up onto the mountain, and he called to him those whom he desired. He chose you because he desired you. And so next time you find yourself questioning your worth, next time you find yourself questioning your usefulness for the Lord because of your perceived failings in life, which, by the way, is an attack on your mind from the enemy, remind the enemy and remind yourself that despite your failings, you are desired by God that you are desired by the highest power and authority, that you are desired by the creator and sustainer of all things. And despite your failings, you are called and you are appointed by God for a time such as this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, it's really just that last bit about being desired by you. It's actually quite moving that you would choose us, that you would desire us, that you would have use of us, not because you need to, but because you desire to, because you love to, because you enjoy to. So Father, I thank you for just every Christian here. Thank you for the calling and the appointing upon their lives, first and foremost, to be with you. Father, forgive us where we've allowed other things to distract us from that primary thing, to be with you, to spend time with you, to commune with you. Father, help us with our priorities. Help us to recognize things in our life that rob our affections for Jesus, that those things might go and that our affections for Jesus would be stirred. Father, we thank you for this wonderful ministry that you have given us, this ministry of reconciliation. It's going to look different for everyone. May we not compare ourselves to one another. We see some people out on the streets and feel guilty because we don't do that. Well, God's not necessarily calling you to do that. Help us to be faithful where you've planted us, whether that's in the workplace whether that's in a a social group, in a friendship group, whatever, to be faithful where you have planted us, in our homes, with our families. And we thank you, Lord, for signs and wonders. Lord, I, I believe they're still for today. Help us not to despise them, to reject them, but to welcome them by being accompanied with the preaching of the gospel. Help us to be bold in preaching the gospel to those who are lost, to pray for those who are broken. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, we pray today. We just pray against an attack of the enemy which would put into question our value to you, our our usefulness to you. We thank you that we are valued by you. That was demonstrated by your son dying on the cross. And so we give you thanks. We give you praise. Help us to walk and to live as a people who have been called and appointed. In Jesus' name, amen.